burnout in the physician world is affecting 65% plus of all of us. 25% are depressed, 13% are suicidal, and every year more than 400 plus, you know, uh, die by suicide, which is really, really tragic. To think that our colleagues are thinking that is a choice, that is a solution to their pain, and that they're alone, that they, nobody else is feeling what you know they're feeling at the moment. And I want to offer that there's a lot of hope that there is a, another way forward, there's another side to it, and that you are really worthy, and your life is so, so important, and that if you're struggling, please to just reach out for help. Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. Thought, feeling, action. And that's a process that we all go over probably thousands, if not more, uh, times every single day. And the stories that we tell ourselves lead us down a path. Uh, We have to be careful. We have to understand what that path is, where it goes, uh, and why we're doing it. A lot of us will reach out uh, towards real estate and other types of investments as we search this thing called freedom. And if we really dig down to understand why, what is it? What do we want freedom for, freedom of? Uh, I just want to create this process or this path where I want to practice my profession because I want to, not because I need to. And today's guest knows so much about this. She's experienced burnout twice herself. And since then, she's the founder of physiciancoachsupport.com, where doctors get peer support over Zoom 24-7. She's a certified life coach and one of the few female urologists in the country. Everybody, please welcome Diana Londonio to the show. Diana, welcome to the show. We have uh, already a huge milestone that we have to check off today. We are both on the same Riverside link today with this podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brett. Thank you so much for having me. It's always just a pleasure. I'm so humbled to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a little struggle getting on to here. But while I was uh, waiting, and we were both waiting on each other, that was fascinating. I got some time to go through your uh, content a little more. And I'm so excited to to weave and uh, make these connections. Um, because we talk about this a lot in the physician world. I'm not a physician. I'm, I come from the real estate, the construction world. So I have an outside outsider perspective of this idea of burnout. And um, I, I just, I'm excited to talk about it again today to see if there's anything just to drop those little nuggets along the way. If we could ever plant these seeds to help somebody out along the way, I think that's so, uh, so cool. So why don't we start off, Diana, by letting the listeners know a little bit about your medical background and kind of walk into that idea of burnout. I'm sure that journey is going to uh, hash itself out here. Yeah, well, thank you, Brad. So uh, I'm Diana Londoño. I'm a urologist in Los Angeles. So I'm a surgeon that deals with anywhere where the urine passes, you know, kidneys, ureter, bladder, all the genitals. And really, you know, we do both surgery and we also see patients in clinic. We do a lot of procedures. And I am blessed to be one of the few urologists who are women. There's only about 10% of us in the U.S., slowly growing. It probably went up a little bit this past year. But it really is a privilege to be one of the few. I think it's a superpower to be in great company with a lot of our male colleagues and really doing things that really can help quality of life and talking about issues that bring a lot of shame, you know, like problems with leakage, erection, sexuality, pain. You know, these are really important topics that can bring shame just like burnout can. I mean, I think there's a lot of of similarities that burnout, stress, asking for help, mental health, wellness, or crisis. You know, these are things that we try to keep in the closet. We want to do by ourselves. We don't want to let other people know. So I think in some ways there is a parallel because it's so important whether you are my patient and you come to me or anybody as a urologist and you're struggling with something in your sexual health, your urinary health, you got to speak up and talk to others about it. There's no shame. And similarly, if you're dealing with anxiety, depression, burnout, 
you know, it's so, so, so important to reach out for help, to talk to anybody, whether it's, you know, a counselor, a therapist, a coach, a friend, you know, a trusted anybody, really, it's so, so important to realize you're not alone. You know, burnout in the physician world is affecting 65% plus of all of us. 25% are depressed, 13% are suicidal. And every year, more than 400 plus, you know, uh, die by suicide, which is really, really tragic to think that our colleagues are thinking that is a choice that is a solution to their pain and that they're alone, that they, nobody else is feeling what, you know, they're feeling at the moment. And I want to offer that there's a lot of hope that there is a, another way forward. There's another side to it and that you are really worthy and your life is so, so important. And that if you're struggling, please to just reach out for help. And I noticed uh, very interesting that connection or correlation that you've made between uh, speaking to patients in your field uh, and how that correlates to other physicians kind of being uh, reserved to speak up about their feelings. But before we got there, I, I think you've actually had a couple of instances yourself that you've dealt directly with this. Can you tell us kind of like a summary of of those instances? And if you've got one, how do you how do you get over it and then come back and do it again? Yeah, that's a great question because you feel like, well, one time is enough and you're not going to experience this again. But it can happen in the same person. It can happen again if you don't realize you know, what got you there and how to get out and really how to maintain. I think also whether it's burnout we're talking about or medicine, we are very reactive. We treat the disease. We don't prevent. And I think in both instances, if you don't prevent, then you are going to end up with illness. You're going to end up with burnout. And burnout, just to clarify, it is chronic unmanaged stress and then leads to this symptom of burnout. And it can feel, you know, you're apathetic. You feel like the personalized meaning like for example, for, for us as physicians, that patient is no longer a patient with a name and a, you know, a symptom. It's just sort of like a diagnosis. We we don't really relate anymore. And it's dangerous because we could, you know, we will have mistakes when we are in burnout. We literally are thinking about how to end our lives instead of taking care of you as a patient. So it's not good care. We're not empathetic. We're not compassionate. You'll see that they're angry, that they don't even, you know, will give eye contact because you're just struggling and suffering. So that's sort of how, you know, it'll get to it. But for me personally, probably the second time is, is what I want to talk about because I think so many people could relate uh, because for me it was really physical. And I know speaking to many physicians, it, it really does become physical. You'll have, you know, neck pain and back pain and, you know, uh, you have this dread that you don't want to get out of the car and go into your clinic. I mean, there's this sensation of doom and gloom. Uh, for me, it was really you know, hair falling out, grinding my teeth, I had like reflux, I developed asthma at 42, which is pretty remarkable to develop that, but stress is an inflammatory state. We are releasing this hormones called cortisol, the stress hormones. So you're in a chronic whole body inflammatory state. So I developed asthma, had like debilitating chest pain, and I was, you know, I'm a runner, so I couldn't even like walk across the room. Uh, I ended up having like joint pain, and uh, they've checked something called rheumatoid factor, which is seen in autoimmune diseases. And basically, you know, your body just attacks itself at the end of the day. And then you probably will going to, you know, end up with cancer if you continue because it's an inflammatory state. You're attacking your own body. So, you know, that was because I was in a state of stress and fear and all these hormones get released. And so you really don't have to change your life. You don't have to change your job, your family, your kids, all that. But you have to change what you put your attention to how you start your day, you know, really what you put your energy and time and attention to. And when you change that and you change how you view things and how you do things every day, then things really can change. Um, so these signs, that, that stress and that fear and all these things you're talking about, very remarkable, real symptoms of something. What was the cause the second time around for you that was causing the stress and this fear? What was it? that was kind of eating away at you every single day. It was like a ball and chain. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was COVID. I mean, everybody has a different, you know, relationship to COVID. But for me, uh, I really was afraid. I was not even a frontline, you know, position, but I really was definitely afraid of what it was, what could happen. Uh, it was really triggering a lot of things, even from, you know, past childhood, probably trauma. But I was in a state of fear. And I also absorbed everybody else's fear and seeing what was happening to colleagues and, 
seeing some just literally were dying at the beginning when we had no masks, we had no idea what it was. And mm. just reading like this Facebook feed of news that is just inflammatory and it just is there to get you scared. I mean, that was not helping anything. So mm. I was really putting my attention into that. Again, reading all these stories that just were making like the story worse than, you know, probably had to be. So it just really, again, the stress hormones were like off the hook. And that really was a place where, you know, you really learn what fear and stress does and how it really affects your body. And, you know, you don't have to get to the point, but again, many of my colleagues will have these pains in their back and their neck. Uh, they will just feel dreadful. They, again, will have anxiety. They'll have depression, panic attacks. They will just break down and not want to get out of bed. I mean, they really will go to a breakdown. And I just hope that people don't get to that point, that they really start realizing we can be preventative and we don't have to crash and burn. And and if we are in a place where we're feeling hopeless and we're feeling, you know, alone, then definitely like reach out for help. Uh, you mentioned there, I guess my take on that is you were, you were seeing real world stuff. You had colleagues, you weren't necessarily frontline, but what I'm hearing you say is that you uh, were actually afraid of something you were telling yourself. Like it almost sounds like to me, there was a story that was on repeat in your mind. And each time you told yourself it got worse and worse and you thought of the worst things, the worst outcomes. Um, and that's very interesting. Uh, also tied into the childhood thing, like what happens in the first seven years of our life and how that conditions us to make these decisions and tell these stories to ourselves throughout the year. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist or anything like that. From my own experience seeing these things, I can definitely see firsthand experience of, of these types of things going in, these stories that we're telling ourselves. Um, and the self-realization point too of what we see or these moments like, okay, Diana, how did you come out like that second time you saw all these symptoms and now you're, you're realizing that it's the stress of like the COVID situation for you. What was the turning point for you? Like, how did you come away from that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely did not learn this at UCLA and I went to UCLA medical school. It's a pretty good school, but it was not taught stress, trauma. I mean, that's just not even part of the curriculum or even nutrition to, to also add to that. But I really had to go back and learn and like start reading books and understanding like what is happening in my body? What, what, what am I feeling? Like what's happening in my you know, brain, my brain cells, like these neurotransmitters, what is getting released that is making me feel that? I mean, what can I do to get me out of this fight or flight, you know, in the sympathetic place and get me into a rest and digest parasympathetic. So trying to change that nervous system and understanding really what it's doing. Because again, what we learned is so basic and it had nothing to do with this and just really understanding, well, what do I have to do every day? What do I have to put my attention to? You know, what changes do I have to make to get a different place? Um, and for me, it was really, I started learning about coaching and, you know, coaching is just really kind of changing these movies that we make in our head. You know, we are excellent storytellers and we tell ourselves these stories that gives us grief and suffering and pain that, you know, are really not true most of the time. Uh, yeah. But we really do believe they're true. So if we believe in our head, then it becomes real. So with coaching, what it can do is kind of poke holes uh, these ideas and stories we make and ask ourselves, is that really true? You know, is, is this thing we're spinning on and repeating our head, is that really true? And mm -hmm. it's really about awareness. I mean, basically, it's about realizing there could be any circumstance you can choose in the world, but that circumstance, we're going to have a thought about it. That thought is going to give you feeling. From that feeling, you're going to act, you know, and then from the action, you're going to get a result. So when we can sort of step back a little bit and understand what are our thoughts, you know, having that mindfulness and awareness, then we can start changing what our outcome and our results going to be. So it started really with sort of coaching principles, which are actually Buddhist principles, but, you know, really then led me more to like meditation for me personally, we can call it prayer, we could call it whatever you like, but, you know, just a time of quieting down and again, getting into that rest and digest and not that fight or flight. And really tapping to things I didn't know about, like gratitude. And, you know, there is not just it sounds fun. I mean, it really will change your neurochemistry. It will change what happens to your body, how you feel. So, you know, making those changes daily of starting my day in a different way was really, really helpful. And it really was changing because I don't have those symptoms. I'm, 
healthy. I am calm. I sleep well. You know, I'm in a different place. Happy. Than, than, than when I was like in this dread yeah. of my like, gloom. Yep. Um, these stories that we tell ourselves uh, is very interesting. And I've, I oftentimes will, I love talking about changing your mind and changing your life. You change your mind, you change your life. And that idea of the thought, feeling, and action is that point in case. Because our brain doesn't know, again, I'm not a, I have not studied neurology or neuroscience, but our brain does not know what right from wrong, real from fake, right? It's, it's this idea, it's doing its job to make us right. Right. So if I tell it this thought, it wants to make that thought right. And if I think of these stories that are just, you know, OK, they start off a little bad. And then next time I tell myself, it starts off, it keeps getting worse and then worse. And all of a sudden, it's just that gloom and doom everywhere. So changing your mind, change your life. I saw on your Instagram, I absolutely love it. Changing your mind by cha- moving your body, change your body. Change you, so this idea of movement um, is awesome. It makes me happy just to think about it. Yeah, movement, I mean, it's so powerful. I think movement is definitely life and health. And you can think of, I mean, I can go back to urology too, but you know, if you can't get the urine out, if it's not moving out of your body, there's going to be pain and there's going to be infection and there's going to be badness happening. So whether you can't pee or your mind or like your thoughts are just spinning in this loop and you're not moving out of that loop. If you're not moving your body, you know, you're not going to feel well. So I think when we are feeling stuck, especially, or even if you're feeling angry or even like a little anxious, moving your body is going to really help you move out of those emotions. Yeah. You don't have to put it on Instagram. You can just do it at home, put on the music (laughs) that you like, that makes you feel alive, that makes you feel happy. And you will change your internal state. I mean, music is a frequency and we're all frequency. We're all energy. I mean, Einstein said yep. it, I didn't. You know, we are all energy. So when you can get to that frequency uh, of a different place of like the sadness and apathy and gloom, you know, you're going to feel better. And so movement is huge. And that's why exercise too is so important. And you don't have to get crazy. You can just go walk or bike or surf, whatever is fun for you. Mm-hmm. But moving your body with exercise it's a type of meditation. I mean, you're moving the breath, you are moving your body, you're sweating out all the stress energy. So that is just as powerful as antidepressants, but nobody's prescribing exercise, but it's so, so powerful. And you can do it and it's free most of the time. You don't have to even pay for it. So whether you're dancing, you could call movement, you're exercising, going outside, being in nature, it is so, so healing. Um, And it could just be just as powerful as like an antidepressant. Yeah, this kinesiology idea. And I, I first, I guess, started noticing or picking it up, uh, reading Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins stuff and how he relates uh, the movement. And then I've implemented in my own life. I love doing this too, is sometimes when I have a 10 year old and 11 year old, and sometimes they'll get all bogged down, you know, and, and your quick kids are kind of quick to tell these stories, you know, the world is ending because I can't eat cereal or something at that moment, right? But in those moments, exercising this idea of kinesiology, say, okay, you're frustrated like this, if you literally just have them raise their arms or raise their hands to the ceiling, it's like they instantly have to start fighting the smile back in that that. St- uh, change of state is like instant for them. Sometimes it's harder for us to have a change of state based on the strength that these stories have, the anchor, right? The table with all the legs that we've built for these stories. But that idea of changing your mind by moving your body is is an awesome thing. And gratitude is another thing that that pairs so well in that. So if you can start your day, it sounds like you've changed your uh, life this way, starting your day with gratitude and movement. Um, I absolutely love it. And it's just getting yourself focusing on the, the things that are, are, are that you're blessed with in your life, as opposed to this fear or the stress that's tied into it. Now you've got this page, um, that you're sharing this, these opportunities, these thoughts, your studies, the connections, uh, with other people. This it's called physiciancoachsupport.com. And I'm on there and I'm seeing these other kind of general, maybe, um, experiences that have been shared with you, uh, in your community. What are some other known situations? Obviously everybody's going to be a little bit different. Everybody tells themselves uh, just a story that's just a little bit different uh, that drives them into feeling uh, this way and taking certain actions. But what are some common 
uh, burnout, you know, reasons that you've, that you've been made known of? I think it's huge and it doesn't matter if you're a physician or not, but boundaries are huge. And, you know, learning to say no is such an important skill. And if you have kids like you do, you'll know for sure that kids have no problem saying no, but we beat it out of them. And especially if they're girls, even more, because we always tell them like, oh, be nice, be a good girl. Like you have to say yes. And that's just crazy. You know, Mm. like that is a gift for them to learn to say no to things. I mean, even though it frustrates us as parents, like when they say, no, I don't want to take a shower or whatever it is. But this skill of learning to say no is so important because when we say yes to everything, then we feel like overwhelmed. Then we are just so thin because all our energy is spread everywhere. And many of these things that we, we even say yes to are like unpaid. And there's, you know, like there's no compensation for our time, especially as women, this will happen. And I can you're going to feel depleted. You're not going to have time for other things like playing music or things that you want to do or going to the gym or spending time with your kids or whatever you want to do for your own you know, self-care and filling up your cup is not going to happen. So I see a lot of like this fear of saying no, this fear of like, I cannot do that. Uh, And then when we live in fear, again, what is happening? We're living in fear and then our stress hormones just go all over our body. So when we change the way we think, the way we, um, you know, are acting out of fear and move it to love, It's just so much different. I mean, love is just a beautiful frequency that is expansive and you just feel like much different, you know, than when you're in fear. So, you know, when we say, oh, I cannot do that because you're afraid of what they'll think of you, they're afraid of, you know, whatever you are afraid of and just start turning that love towards you and yourself and make that decision from a place of love, then it's very, very different. You know, your action will be different. Again, it comes from a feeling, but that feeling has to have a thought. And that thought has to be like, I'm important. I'm valuable. I got to do the best for me. It's not narcissistic and to take care of myself. So really changing those thoughts and putting yourself as the priority because we put everybody else first. And then again, what happens? We are left depleted. We're left overwhelmed. We're like bitter, angry. Like this is just not a way to live. So we got to change those thoughts, um, those feelings out of fear and into love. Mm -hmm. Um, this, the idea of not being able to say no, uh, it, it creates this machine. And I see it a lot with, uh, high performance people, mm-hmm. um, just go, go, go drive, drive, drive. And we end up be- creating these systems, these machines that eat us because we continue to create situations where we can't say no, we keep going. And then we'll throw it all the way back to, to the idea of uh, in that first seven years, you know, the childhood um, times where something's conditioned us to to continue to do this, uh, and that idea of paid and time, I keep relating this. I'm I'm just curious uh, if there's that idea of doing this is driving a lot of people to burnout, um, trying to find a way out of. I'm practicing medicine because I need to now, versus how I started because I wanted to. Right. So I've got this thing and I continue to do this more clinical, more of this, helping this person out, doing this uh, where it's eating into my time. I'm not getting paid the way I should. And then we'll bring insurance into this whole thing, which is a whole nother world. Um, And even even in like they're not prescribing exercise when they should. Well, in in a certain situation, that could come back to paid in time and money thing because of the, you know, the medicine is the way to prescribe and for money to turn and all those kinds of things. So much goes into that, Diana. But long story short, how much of a burnout then is related to paid scenarios, getting paid, um, losing time. I'm not investing my time. Uh, I'm doing things because I need to versus I want to. Yeah, that's a, there's a lot to that. I mean, I, I kind of want to go back a little bit to understand, you know, rest. I think in our culture, like you were saying, the high performance, you know, people and then the high achievers is always like, go, 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 go. And like, like our society is so, 
you know, they're, they're just so focused on like doing, 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 and like realizing we're not human doings, we're human beings and just the being and the resting. I mean, our heart, if we think about our heart or anything in nature, I mean, they rest, like there's seasons, like there's not many flowers that bloom all year long. I mean, they rest, they hibernate and they come back. Our heart pumps and then rest, pumps and rest. It's not just pump, 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 or you can't continue to inhale, 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 inhale. You got to exhale. So there has to be a balance, but our society thinks that the more you do, the more you do is the way to be. And when we don't realize rest is crucial and that is so important and that actually is going to make you more effective, more creative, you know, uh, give you more energy to do all the things you want to do. It's like, well, something's off and then it's going to catch up. We think we're invincible. We think we just keep going, but then people keep going because they're, you know, doing like tons of caffeine, drugs, you know, whatever stimulants they can get their hands on, or, you know, they're addicted to something, obviously overworking and shopping and sex and something. I mean, you have some addiction to keep you going. Then again, there's no balance and that that's not healthy. So we have to realize rest is essential and it's not something to, you know, shame people for doing and, 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 and that you should not do. I mean, that, that's, that's insane not to rest. To not understand the importance of sleep. Sleep is so crucial. And again, there's many, uh, you know, people, many, uh, you know, many uh, professions where, again, it's looked down upon like, oh, I'll sleep when I die, like kind of things. And it's like, it's so critical for your metabolism, for your hormone balance, for your mood. Uh, to be sleeping, you know, if if you don't sleep, you know, things just look terrible. You're just in a bad mood. Your outlook is not as good. Then if you get a good rest, I mean, you can just start with that and then understanding all the changes is going to go to, again, your hormones, your testosterone, if you're a man, I mean, that will change. So if you want to feel better, if you want to look better, you know, you have to rest and you have to understand too, the power of drinking water, nutrition, and everything we put into our bodies is either going to be our disease or our health. So again, like the basics are just basics, but we just skip to them and we think we're just better than the basic things. But sleep and drinking water and good nutrition and movement and being in nature and having connection, you know, being with the kids or family, I mean, those things are crucial. But again, we want to say like those are not important, that you know, the car and the purse and the big title, that's important. We just got to chase that. And when we get that, we'll be happy. And the reality is you're really not going to be happy when you get there. You're lonely and there's nobody else there and you're sick and you have a heart attack because of all the stress that you had. So, you know, your health is the biggest wealth we can have. It really Mm -hmm. is. And we got to, you know, really nurture it and put attention to it. Without health, there is no wealth. That is for sure. And this idea of being guilty, and I've felt that so much too, because I've had wonderful people in my life that has allowed me to have these moments of self-realization be like, okay, I can like, I will put, I will work all night. I will sleep four hours the next day. I will keep going. Nobody will outwork me. I'll keep going. And it was just, it was detrimental to my health and to be able to have that moment of self-realization is wonderful. Have those people around you to help you have those moments of self-realization is huge. But even in those moments now where, okay, I'm going to sleep eight hours a night. Like I am happy. I'm so happy with where I'm at. I've limited, uh, you know, the, the size of the business that we have. I'm just, I am happy. I get to have wonderful conversations like this and hopefully plant these little seeds in the the one person that's listening today to grab that seed so that then could be nurtured by another guest or these are the opportunities that I have. But I can feel guilty on this path, Diana, because on those days where uh, yesterday, uh, it was nice out and I'm in the Carolinas and I want to sit by the pool. So I sat by the pool and I'm just thinking sometimes there's this little story that jumps into my head. It's the middle of the day, Brett. What are you doing sitting by the pool, right? You should be up here doing this. And oh no, did I do this? Oh no. And then here comes all these stories, but by that moment of guilt, where if you you uh, just let it go, I would just continue, continue to, and then start stress. And but no, I've got I've got it done. I'm happy here. I like the sunshine. I like sitting by the pool. Give me thirty minutes. That's all I need, right? So the guilty can overtake uh, that new story that we're telling ourselves. So we have to be 
uh, uh, cautious of cautious of that. The other thing to be cautious of too, this car purse title thing uh, is like a lifestyle creep. And I've even mentioned this to younger physicians too. And it's like an instant snap. Do, you know, don't tell me about delaying gratification. And I've, I've put off so much for so long. Well, this is what happens, whether it may not be that per- person particularly, but as that car comes in, maybe that purse, that title, this is the machine that I'm talking about that creates, whether it's lifestyle creep or not, it creates something that's now you have to do these things because you need to, not because you want to. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a huge thing of, yeah, people feel like, oh, I waited this long and then, you know, the grass can be greener when I have this paycheck. And then also then you kind of are in this lifestyle you truly can't afford actually you know you are buying all these things because you didn't have them before but it's like all in credit and you really are now working to pay for all these things this house that you probably can't afford and you know the purses for your wife and this and that and this vacation and you know people can do whatever they want in their life i'm not going to judge it it's whatever makes you happy but we have to realize then you're going to have golden handcuffs then Mm. you're really stuck then you really don't have the leverage to leave because you have all the stuff to pay that you really truly may can't afford. And so if you live a different lifestyle and then also realize, you know, during training, I mean, the, the, the happiness is not over here. The happiness is that moment when you're resident. And even if you're not making money, like that is a privilege to take care of people. It's a privilege to learn all the things that we're learning. It's a privilege to be there every day, whether you're getting the money compensation or not. I know, People will fight against it, but I mean, the happiness is there and the happiness is the next moment where you're present. It's not, again, yesterday when it was better, when you didn't have this to do. It's not tomorrow when you have that paycheck because that paycheck's going to get here. And believe me, there's not going to be like rainbows and trumpets playing like it's glorious. <laughs> maybe for a second it'll be fun and then you can party and you can celebrate, but the next day it's going to be just back to normal. Mm-hmm. So just always like thinking of the next moment being like where happiness is and chasing it, it, it really is going to be like a bitter surprise where you realize it's not there because then you're going to be like, oh, I need more. I need more dopamine. I need more of this bigger house, bigger this, bigger that, uh, the bigger party, bigger restaurant to go to, to feel this joy and this dopamine. And then you're just chasing dopamine. So I think when you are more present and you realize like the little things, the present moment is where the happiness is. Again, these moments where you can share time with another human being, talk to people, connect with them, like realize we're all very similar. And even though we look differently on the outside, but at the core, we all probably want the same things, like some happiness some connection, some love, feeling valued, feeling we matter and that we contribute to something in the world. I think that's a basic core thing we all have but sometimes we're too afraid to you know break down those layers and those shells and just admit it and then we want to again puff ourselves up with all these things on top of us like fancy clothes and this and that to to sort of feel better but at the core we're like worthy with all that we're worthy with all these diplomas you know they're they're nice decorations in the wall but you know your worth is not tied to that and if you are not a physician anymore if you're not you know, practicing, you're still worthy. You're still like a beautiful human being and soul. And I think people suffer because, you know, maybe they retire, maybe they're in an accident and they can't practice and their whole identity just goes, you know, with them. And then they, they spiral down into depression and anxiety and all these thoughts because they were so tied to that identity that, you know, it's temporary. It's like not the real identity of who you are. And so it's like thinking about those things you know, and putting a different perspective can, I think, help you prevent a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diving in deeper too. One of those uh, things that we all enjoy is being heard uh, or feel like we're being heard. And uh, that's a remarkable piece that the more that we could even listen, be active listeners too, is, is how we can bring others joy. And I know I looked at uh, you know, another one of your posts too about helping, being the smile, you know, putting a smile on somebody's face, bringing the joy for somebody just by these things that you're talking about, um, changing your mind, uh, you can help others along the way. If you could go back, speaking of helping others along the way, say 15 years and having the experience that you have now, sat beside somebody, maybe in the in a similar path, whether it's, um, you know, just starting their medical career, somewhere along those lines, pre-burnout, 
Um, with the experience and knowledge that you have now, Diana, what would you tell that person if you could 15 years ago? I mean, I think it's sort of the same thing about boundaries, but also just realizing to be yourself. I think so many people want to camouflage and be something else and they feel so uncomfortable just being their true selves of like what they want to say, what they want to do. Like they hold back and then, you know, they don't speak their truth. They don't say what they want. And I think also, especially in women, it's so challenging to say like, what do you want? Um, men are women too, but women more, but also you hear a lot of like, what, do, what, what, what is it that I don't want? But what do you actually want? If you don't know what you want, then you can't get to wherever you're trying to go. Because I can, what, what is it that you want? And like, it could be a simple thing, just like, what do you want for dinner? Uh, but then we talk about like, then the bigger things. But if you don't practice in the small things, it like translates to the bigger things in life. So being yourself, being authentic, uh, you know, really learning boundaries to say no and just realizing like you are the most important thing again and you know don't let other people's ideas and thoughts like really color like your ideas about yourself because people are going to say a lot of things people are going to likely medical training you know maybe not be so kind and be very judgmental and you know like that's their stories they're not about you you know anybody that is whole and loving will never say anything and demeaning towards you so you have to kind of step back and realize whatever people say that is not kind that is like what's inside of them you know that's what's spilling over but if you have love and kindness inside of you you would never say that to anybody mm -hmm. else you would be kind and loving and uplifting and celebrate other people so when you see that and your interactions, whether you're a medical student, resident, attending, like realize like that's their trauma. They're vomiting on you <laughs> and don't take it personally as much as, you know, we kind of do um, really just put like a little Teflon bear and be like, oh, that whatever their hate, whatever their nastiness, whatever their meanness is like, that's theirs. Like, I don't have to keep it. I don't have to carry it. I don't have to like hold on to it. That's that's theirs. Um, mm -hmm. And then I also send them like a lot of love and blessings and I hope that they heal. But, you know, I'm not going to stand in that uh, place where they're being hurtful, but I'm not going to take it in as my own. Yeah. Um, hearing somebody's hurt, I think, is something that that I know that I've experienced where it's it's they may be lashing out or it, you get a response to a simple question. It's just like, whoa, wait, what? Uh, it's that you're hearing the pain and that's that that's them um, subconsciously dealing with the pain and lashing out kind of thing. But uh, something else there too, celebrating other people when they are shining. And that is just if you can find that love in your life to be able to share that joy with other people, it's remarkable. Um, your LinkedIn, you say, is the best place for the listeners to connect with you. And that's what's the best way to find you on LinkedIn? Just my name, Diana Londoño, MD, medical doctor. And I'm usually there or my website, dianalondoñomd.com, either one. But usually LinkedIn, I'm, I'm there most of the time. I like to, you know, post things. It's really like my public diary, <laughs> just things I'm dealing with, I like to share with others. So hopefully people don't feel alone. Uh, the other people feel that it's okay to have feelings, to express emotions, and we're not robots, whether you're a physician or not, and it's okay to have feelings, it's okay to talk about love and, and all these things that are so important, because I think that's a core human need uh, for love and for expression, and also writing is very healing, you know, whether you, again, never post anything online, but if you're struggling with anything, Writing can be such a powerful tool mm -hmm. to process your emotions, to like dump all the anger or whatever you're feeling out without ever sending, you know, the email or whatever, but just getting it out can be very, very healing. So you're also sort of moving your thoughts out of your mind and just putting in pen and paper on the computer. You know, that is movement. That is just getting all the stuff out and not holding it in because if you hold all the stuff in, it really does become your disease and it will mm -hmm. become all these symptoms that, you know, I discussed whether it was burnout or not, but like you got to let it go, like let it flow out of you and that can be very healing. But yeah, find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect. Uh, I really, uh, it's a beautiful platform. So I, I'm there all the time. And for the spelling challenged, like myself and those of us who I have a struggle saying things most of the time too, uh, it's L-O-N-D-O-N-O, Lodonio, L-O-N, 
D-O-N-O. So search her up on LinkedIn. You can find her there. And talk about not fitting in the box, being yourself. If we were in the studio, we would be jamming to some tunes right now, and we would dance out of here and have a great time and just share that joy with everybody else. But we've shared it through the words, hopefully planting these seeds. Diana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brad. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Awesome. And to the listeners out there today, I hope that seed is planted. I hope that seed doesn't stick in a box and I hope that seed can grow way outside the box. And uh, you may catch that seed one day when you're nurturing it, maybe shaking a little bit. And that little shake can put a smile on your face. And the next thing you know, somebody else around you is smiling because the energy is contagious. Gratitude is contagious. Love is contagious. Uh, from those moments when somebody strikes out at you with their hurt, Go back to that moment. Start moving, start shaking, start being grateful. You're going to shake somebody's life up in a good way. And if it's you uh, that needs some shaking, needs some moving, look up uh, Diana. Find her. She is a blast. Uh, She's got different platforms. Reach out, connect with her. Uh, She's definitely a blessing. Thank you for your time and your attention today. This is the Real Estate Mogul MD.